Let me introduce you to everyone um, online. Sure. And uh, let me introduce Jordan Balfour, please. Uh, in the 90s, Jordan Balfour built one of the most, most dynamic and successful sales organizations in Wall Street history. To this day, his priority sales training techniques and daily motivational speech, speeches are the stuff of legends, in him the reputation, the motivate, motivator without peer. His life story was turned to a block, blockbuster feature film, The Wolf of Wall Street, with Leonardo DiCaprio playing the role of Balford and directed by Martin Skorinski. And his straight line sales persuasion uh, system has been, has been tested and proven to transform vitality any individual, regardless of any age, sex, education, background, or social status, into a world-class closer and top producer in his field. So please welcome the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Thank Balfour. You. Give him a big Welcome. round of applause, guys. Welcome, Jordan. Great to see you here. Thank you. So I'd love to answer any of your questions and uh, let's roll. Let's rock and roll. Okay, my first question to you. When was the moment you decided to be a global entrepreneur and motivational speaker? Well, I was always an entrepreneur. So I mean, I, I've been starting businesses. I was very small, but you know, my first big business, believe it or not, was, was in the meat and seafood industry and that in my early 20s, which went bankrupt, then became Wall Street. But in terms of globally as a speaker, it actually happened in a moment when I was sitting in my car with my ex-wife. So, so it's my third, number three. She's still another ex-wife. I've not done that well in the marriage department, right? You know, I always say this is like, you know, business mastery and sales mastery, not relationship mastery. I don't teach that one, right? Can't figure that out. But, um, you know, I was, I had written the book, The Wolf of Wall Street, and a sequel to the book. And I made a lot of money, you know, for back then, I was just getting started again after losing everything. And I was about to, I didn't love, I don't love writing. It's something that came difficult to me, right? But I'm proficient at it. And I was about to sell another book to, um, to Warner Brothers to make a movie and the GFC in 2008. And suddenly, just like that, no one was spending money. It was like everything came to a halt and you couldn't sell a book, a screenplay, you couldn't sell a pair of shoes for anything, right? Yeah. And I was really, I had no money. I was sitting with my wife in the car. I'm like, you know what? I don't love this writing. I said, I, I really want to become a speaker and go out and motivate people and, and, and you know, help them uh, with their businesses and stuff, right? And she's like, all right, well, let's do that. And I called my then agent. And I said, hey, his name is Joel. I said, Joel, I want to go out and become a speaker. And he's like, oh my God, that's great. You just got to wait until the movie comes out and then they'll come for you. And I remember in that moment being so fucking pissed. I was like, what? I'm like, wait till they come for me. Wait till the movie comes out. These are things that were out of my control. I'm going to, so let me get this straight. I'm going to wait until Leo and Marty get around and find the whole thing. It all lines up if it ever does. You know, it didn't happen for five more years after that. And I'm going to wait for them to come for me. How about... I'm going to make my own luck and create my own path. I hung up on the guy. And from that moment, I made a decision. I was going to go out there and start speaking. And I started by giving free speeches the first, you know, couple of times. And then people heard me. They were really, you know, blown away. And then I had a big break with some famous person in Britain. You know who it was? Richard Branson. So Richard Branson hired me to speak at his company, Virgin. And he, he heard me watch for an hour and a half speech. and was so blown away. He literally had it taped and he cut it up into vignettes and he released it all over the internet. And that was what launched my career as a speaker. Brilliant, do you know what? Before you come on, we've been talking about Richard Branson for the last half an hour. And like I we do events at uh, Necker Island, um, and Necker Cup. So amazing uh, how the coincidence you just mentioned Richard Branson. Who was the person who most, in, who, who, uh, who most impacted your life and inspired you to become the person you are today? You know, it, it, it's interesting. I, I get asked that question a lot. And I'm and, and, and I want to just be honest with you. I'm one of those rare people. I really never modeled people in the real world as, as I, I, I modeled certain people's strategies. But I never looked at one person and said that, you know, I want to be like them or act like them. I never did that. What I really, honestly, I had some bizarre way when I was very young of looking at the movie characters and saying, I want to be like Richard Gere from Pretty Woman. I want to be like Gordon Gecko from Wall Street, but I wasn't looking at, you know, and remember, I'm, I'm a bit, I'm probably, you know, maybe the same age as some of you guys look around my age, you know, there wasn't like you had the internet and everyone was mentoring back, you know, you didn't have access.
access to things like that to every businessman. So I'm, I'm sure if it was nowadays, I'd probably have, would have connected with people who I'd seen their videos and really got to appreciate their insights. It was very different back then. Either you knew someone or you really couldn't ment be, you know, be, be mentored by them. Yeah, um, I know that. I know. And um, I, I, we, you know, I'm, I, we got, I was inspired by um, my mentor, which uh, Shaman Lecter from um, the co-founder of Rich Dad Poor Dad. And um, she, we learned a lot from her as well. Um, what, what, sort of, what sort of impact did the Hollywood block mover film, The Wolf of Wall Street, have on you in your life? Did it change your life when the film came out? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's interesting. So it didn't so much change my life when the first film first came out. Um, it came out and it was great. I made a lot of money on, you know, that year. And then things kind of slowed down a little bit. And then something odd happened. The movie crossed over and turned into this ultra cult hit coming of age movie. And I just watched in awe as it took on a complete life of its own and became my, my daughter was in college. She's like, dad, I'm in a football stadium in Michigan and they, I'm hearing a song and there's 50,000 people pointing at me and they're saying Jordan Belfort. It was a song came out and like people are dressing up for me as Halloween. And I'm like, I just couldn't believe it. So it was one of those weird things. It wasn't a normal movie. It was a movie that did great in the box office, but then it just became this cult hit, this, this cultural phenomenon where like to this very day, there's 10 memes a day come out with the me and the movie out it. It's just a never ending thing. And my, you know, my most ardent fans gets with the ages, 15. I can't, if I go to out the 15 year olds come running up to me. So it's a really interesting thing that happened. So um, that's the way it was in the beginning. Yes, it made, made a difference. Maybe actually, you know, five, $10 million that first year, but then it just took off. And now it's created a whole branding situation where I get, you know, I'm able to license my name out, my brand and so forth. It's really amazing. Yeah, I, listen, I think everyone who's seen the film all say the same thing worldwide, you know, it's like, wow, Everybody. what a movie. And I think one of the questions you've probably been asked, you know, many times, was, was, the, was the movie played down and what really happened or was it true to fact everything or what, what was it? So it was very, I mean, listen, there were some things that were really, really accurate. There was some, I mean, like the things that you would think were not accurate were actually underplayed. Like the insanity was even worse than that. And um, the things that you might think were, were, were exact, you know, that weren't exaggerated, maybe weren't. Like, for example, um, the one scene that never happened was when, I'm, when I meet with the FBI agent on the boat and I call him on the boat and I thought, you know, that I actually went and investigated the guy. Everything up to that point was I approached my guy to try to find out more about him and who he was. You know, so I did all that, but I never called him onto the boat for a meeting. But other than that one scene, you know, the movie is really generally very accurate. The biggest thing they change is the timeline. So they collapse time. They combine events into like one, for example, the Donnie character had all the bad traits of like five different people. If it was bad, Donnie did it, right? So there was a lot of that going on. Um, but it was, you know, it rang very true. The one thing that was really off a bit though was that they made it seem like we were trying to lose people money, which is just simply not true. Like you would never try to do that. Like, why would you try to sell someone a stock that was going down? Even if you were the worst person in the world, you'd still want the stock to go up because you make more money for yourself. So that part was kind of a bit annoyed me that they were saying like, we're trying to find bad companies. That was the opposite. In fact, we were trying to find good companies, but they're very hard to find because you make so much more on a good company than a bad one. Yeah, oh yeah. Do, do you think they make a Wolf of Wall Street too? So they're making, so interestingly enough, or I'm about to sell the, the documentary, a docu-series to one of the largest streamers in the world, one of the top three, you know, I'm sure you can figure out what those three potential are, yeah. right? Yeah. One of the major ones. And it's a, and a very, very major league budget, like a big budget, supposedly the biggest one they've ever done. So I'm about to do that deal right now as we speak. And then also the TV series and the Broadway show. So um, there's a TV series where I'm just waiting, there's some rights issues. I own the Broadway rights, I own the doc rights, the TV series are just like shared rights. And there was a whole scandal with some people who financed the film, one of them still on this guy, Jolo, 
who from the I don't know if you guys know about the Malaysian scandal where some of the money was stolen. It's a whole story. So so I'm still trying to get though. I'm suing the guy right now to get the TV rights fully back. Brilliant. Oh, that's good. Uh, when's, when's that coming out? Do you think this year or next year? No, the TV would series. The doctors will come out in 2022, probably mid 2022, uh, on one of the major streamers, and it'll at least be one full season, maybe even two or three. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Can't wait to see that. I bet it's going to be amazing. Um, did you have? Did you ever have? When was the moment? When, did you have a pinch me moment when you know when the movie came out and you went? This is going to be something, you know. Did you did you visualize it, or did you, oh, did you yeah. it somewhere? Or? Moments, yeah. So there's the one originally when I first sold the the uh, the book. So there was a bidding war between Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio and Mark Wahlberg and George Clooney. And I remember in my uh, I was in my country club and I'm like, you know, playing tennis, and I get a call, my phone rings, and I'm like, my agent's like, you're not gonna believe this. Like right now, both Leo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt said, whatever he pays, I'll pay 10% more. And I and the bidding just went up and up and up all weekend. And finally, Leo approached Scorsese, and then they, you know, together came to me. I'm like, well, Leo and Marty. You know, plus, I always loved Leo, and I sold it to Leo at the end of that weekend. That was the first one. I was like, I couldn't even believe it because the next day it was all over the press that the uh, that this bidding war happened, and the book wasn't even released yet. So it instantly made the book sell in like 40 countries. So that was the first time. That was the pinch me moment. Yeah. Excellent. excellent. Okay. Um, what would you say, what would you say your greatest achievement is to date and why? I think my, my, my greatest achievement is probably, you know, overall, like, you know, coming back from that oh. and, uh, being able to turn that into a complete sto a story that inspires oh, yeah, that's people. Right. Then go strange enough, but why not chat a little bit about it? Well, there All right, need people muted there. Hold on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that the, just the, the the idea that it was able to you know not just make me money. That I never doubted I'd make a lot of money again, even after I went to jail and lost everything. I knew I'd make money, but it was this idea that my life came to be as as like this, this story that inspires all these people around the world. Like whenever I go out now, I you know I I always get stopped by many many people when I'm out in the street. And the one common thing I, I hear more than anything else is, you know what, you changed my life. Like I was really you know my. I was going through a rough time where I didn't think I had it in me or, and I just, you know, I just, you know, I just saw your life and everything you teach and it just gave me the strength to go and really do. And now I'm successful. Like that's probably the greatest thing I've accomplished was being able to use what happened as a way to empower other people. And I think, I think also I'm going to ask you now as well. Um, one of the, other, the greatest things that you did is teach, teach people is the straight line system. Tell us a bit, a little bit more about the straight line system that you that you invented. Sure. So, so I, I think that one of the things that comes through in the movie somewhat, but actually came through a lot more in the first cut. The first original cut was four hours long that Marty released. It was only seen by maybe five hundred people in in tests, and it was just too long to release in theaters. And in that cut there was probably another 30 minutes of sales training. So I, I think, what, what, I think this one works right. yeah, out. Hey guys. Can that you person you turn, turn off the mute? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. oh, do you want to make me co-host and I can mute everybody for you or you, you saw it? Yeah, yeah, if you can mute everyone, I guess, except for the two of us, that's... uh. Yeah. Yeah, someone's got their 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 speakers on. You know, is not muted. Anyway, hold on. I'll just um, uh, I'll tell you, uh, um, Tom. We're getting, we're getting an insight to someone else's household. You know, someone woman's talking to someone. You know, if you give them a little yeah. shit. <laughs> you, you there, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here, bud. Yeah, but make me co-host and I'll mute everybody. Have you done it? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. You okay? Yeah, I'm gonna try and mute everybody if I can. Uh, okay, I think that's probably done it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't think I've muted you, Jordan. So uh, sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Jordan. Sure. What was the question now? Um, tell us a little bit about, about, the, about uh, more about the straight line system that you invented. Yes, what I was saying was that, that, that it, it came through in the movie, but what, re you know, what was really behind the success of what happened at the firm, it, it was two things that came together at once. First, is I stumbled upon this untapped niche in the stock market, which was selling five to ten dollar stocks to the richest one percent that that had never really been tried before in wholesale fashion and that was part of it but then that created a problem that when i tried to do it myself it worked and with danny it worked but when i tried to teach the other kids to sell to rich people they weren't able to the system i was teaching before that it just wasn't powerful enough and it, and it really forced me to come up with a new way of teaching people and explaining to people how you go about closing. And it took about a month of trial and error until one day I finally, like, you know, I had this, this thought in my head. I was so frustrated because my guys were, weren't closing. It was about a month after I'd invent, I stumbled upon this niche. So I'm making a fortune. Danny's making a fortune. I have a 50% closing rate. Danny's is in the high 30s. And my guys are zero. I'm like, what the hell? We're calling the same leads same reading the same script and like what is going on and and ultimately i stumbled on this this entirely new what was then a new methodology of really of really what it means to essentially close how do you how do you from the moment you open up your mouth to the moment where they either buy or don't you know what you know what's going on how do you take someone who's not naturally great selling and very quickly turn them into a world-class closer that's really what straight line does and it was behind all of the success of the firm and then when the firm split broke up in 1997 all the brokers left and they would they took this you know varied watered down versions of the straight line to all these different industries and i started noticing that whatever industry they went into private jets insurance these guys were building massive businesses being top producers right automobile sales I mean, you know, dozens of industries right and then eventually when i decided to go out and start teaching the straight line system. That was about a year and a half after I started speaking. Originally, when I went out and started speaking, it was just about general motivation, the inner game of success. And I was kind of almost not real scared, but reluctant to teach people how to sell again because it created so much mayhem, like what I had done. Like the straight line is very powerful. And when I, the way I was using it, Without ethics, it can be very damaging. So, like, I had this sort of limiting belief, and ultimately, you know, everywhere I go, like, if someone just hear a little bit, like, that's what I want to hear. You know, the universe is telling me. So, I shifted my message to, you know, from not just teaching people about success, but also giving them actual skill set that allowed them to achieve success. And that was the straight line system. So, what really ended up happening was the movie was green lit. And this is a great story, by which really everyone can learn from. In 2007, I sold the rights. The script was written by a man named Terrence Winter, brilliant writer, Sopranos, World War Empire. And the first version of the script is pretty much the version that came out six years later. In fact, the movie was greenlit in 2007. And then just as they were about to start filming, the writer's strike happened in Hollywood and they couldn't polish, they couldn't finish polishing the dialogue. So we missed the window and Leo and Marty went off to did, did Shutter Island because that was actually a finished script, right? So I was now devastated. My book hadn't come out yet. And I was like, I thought it was gonna be this amazing, the movie would come out. Now at the time I was broke, I had no money. Um, I was just a writer that just came out of jail. So the script ended with me going to jail. That's how the movie ended. So it was a great movie, but it had this sort of down ending where everyone, you know, like, guess what happens? And the guy gets his comeuppance and goes to jail. There was a delay over about five years. And, you know, Leo had come to my house very early on when I first sold it to him in 2007. And I lived in a tiny apartment. Five years later, I was rich again. I made fortune of money using the straight line. I was teaching the straight line around the world, making tens of millions of dollars. I was living in a mansion on the water. Leo calls me in 2012 and says, hey, I want to come over. Let's start hanging out for the movie. And he comes over and I'm in this mansion. He's like, what the fuck happened to your life? I'm like, oh, you know, I, I teach the straight line system. And, it's about, and I teach people how to sell. I do sales. Oh, show me a video. And I showed him the video. 
And he's like, oh my God, Marty is gonna go absolutely crazy. He sends Marty the video. They're like, that's it. We're rewriting the whole movie. They rewrote the entire third act and made it a comeback story. So now the movie no longer ended with me going to jail. There's this extra scene that I actually have a cameo in where he's like giving a seminar. And even earlier, they inserted this thing where I'm doing infomercials teaching the straight line. And it made it an infinitely better movie. It made this comeback story. So it's a, really an example of how, you know, something bad happens, the movie got canceled, but it ended up, you know, you, your life happens while you create it. And I changed the ending of my own life story and made it into this amazing comeback story, which serves as a commercial for my business. To this very day, my business just constantly grows from this movie. And, and that's a really empowering story for people to know. Oh, it's a, it, it is. I can imagine it is. Uh, it is life changing as well. Um, one of the one of the biggest things that that uh, I, I'm I'm uh, believing is obviously the power of networking. How important do you think networking is for businesses who are looking to grow globally? And how how, how important has networking been in your in your career in your life? It's unbelievably important. It, it really, really is. And at times, I've neglected that rule myself. And, you know, and, and watch that when I started engaging in more networking, how it had an exponential effect on my growth. It really did. So like, for example, especially in the world today, you know, when we live in a global society you know, with, with the ability to do affiliate deals and, and joint ventures, I mean, wow. I mean, I got to tell you, like I, I have in my house every three months, I run a mastermind at my house where I have like 10 very wealthy people come to my house and we spend two days together. And it's amazing, a lot of knowledge transfer, but more than anything, it's not what happens during those two days. It's all the things that happen afterwards from the context that you make it, from everyone's Rolodex. And my Rolodex is, you know, internal. I can get to anybody anywhere pretty much with one or two calls. And so it, it just, the power, I've seen it, what it could do for people, not just in saving them from like making mistakes, but just growing really fast. So I think it's invaluable. Yeah, and how, how and, and how you uh, you put that is exactly how I say it. Uh, without networking, you haven't got a business, and um, it, it's so it's so important for your career uh, wherever you are in life. Um, what just just ch- turning the subject? Um, a lot of our guys are, are in uh, the, the stock market and investors. Um, what advice would you give to people wanting to invest in Bitcoin right now? What, what sort of what's your advice on that? So I'm bullish. I mean, I, I've been bullish. So, you know, originally when Bitcoin first made its massive run, I was really bearish. So, and I was right. I mean, I, in 2017, almost to the day, that was the fact that it was to the day was lucky. It just happened to be interviewed like right before it crashed. I was thinking it was going to crash for about a month or two before that, but I came out, I was on CNN and, and CNBC, was like two or three interviews. I'm like, this is going, I thought it was going to zero. Like it is get out now. It was like 17, 18,000. And literally the thing just collapsed like almost the day after that and went down to, I think as low as 2000 and people got absolutely slaughtered. What I was wrong about was I thought it would never come back. I, I, and, and the reason, and what I always was very clear about was that, listen, I love blockchain technology. I think blockchain is elegant. It's got a lot of use cases, but I just think that there's too much sovereign risk. I was, I was said, how could the governments allow a currency that they don't control that is so easily used for nefarious activities? Why on earth would they allow this to happen? Just it boggled my, I couldn't understand. I think a lot of people felt this way and still do, but now I, I really believe that there's enough adoption is enough mainstream adoption enough at least loose regulation that i don't think it's going to get out we saw something happen now with turkey just outlawed it but turkey is a very small part of it but i really believe at this point that it's it's enough into the system that the sovereign risk wall is still there i don't think it's a knockout punch anymore i thought it could be a knockout but when they'll say it's illegal you got it's worthless that was my big fear so given that and the fact that there's this, you know, adoption now, um, you know, very widespread institutionally as well, um, I really believe that Bitcoin goes higher, 
before it goes lower. Now, do I know that to be true? No, I mean, that's just my opinion. For all I know, it could crash tomorrow and go to, you know, the government's gonna say no more Bitcoin. I doubt that, but in my sense, it goes to 100,000 before it goes back down to 20,000. I think it's gonna take a major slide down at some point again. I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if after it made a big move up, it has a massive move down and then it built another base and then we'll see what happens. Because there's a lot of systemic risk here with, with governments. I just don't think it's a knockout punch anymore. So I'm short term, very bullish. I'm heavily involved and I'm heavily involved in, in, um, in the actual infrastructure around Bitcoin more than so much speculating on which way the coins are going to go. I'm long versus short, but I'm more interested in things that blockchain technology can accomplish and also in things like decentralized finance and decentralized commerce. I'm a big believer in that, for example, like right now, crypt crypto is not used really at all in commerce. It's just a store of value right now, which is the opposite of what it was originally envisioned as by Satoshi, if you believe he exists. He's maybe he's the NSA for all we know, right? But who really knows? But the point, that'll be the best joke ever. It's actually the reason they never rallied because it's the US government, right? And they're gonna get into a 20 trillion and pay up their deficit by selling their Bitcoin to the world, right? Who knows? But, any, but anyway, who knows what's gonna happen? But the point is, is that um, I believe that ultimately as it continues to flourish and have more and more users and the volatility issue can be ad addressed and there's a way to actually use it to a payment service that allows people, merchants and consumers to transact in Bitcoin instantaneously without fees. I think that's gonna be a massive, massive play. So I'm involved with companies that are involved in doing that. And that's very close to fruition to, do, to be able to actually go to a store and say, I wanna pay in Bitcoin. And it's not, cause it might not be trying to any of these things, they're ridiculous. The services they have like BitPay, and it's a joke. Like they just hit you for massive currency exchange fees. You really can't even use it. It's a, it's a complete, it's a sham. You cannot use Bitcoin right now in real, in real commerce. So I think it's a big play right there. Hmm. Okay, good. Um, and obviously we're just coming out of, um, you know, Corona virus here. Uh, in the UK, and um, what, what's what's the what's the sort of best advice you would give to people who who have struggled during coronavirus to sort of get their businesses back up again? What advice would you give? So, number one, there's one thing that that Corona taught me is that you always have to be adapting, and you always have to have a plan B. I mean, you just have to have a plan B always, right? And that I was lucky in the sense that I already had that sort of I had a business that was virtual and on and offline and my offline business collapsed for the most part although i'm still I'm still traveling right now and you know consulting in in mexico and getting paid a lot but i was like very aggressively going around the world and, I, and the thing is it's more efficient to do it virtually but i loved going i mean i love face to face i just enjoy it i enjoy meeting people i enjoy sharing culture and all these different things right so i, I think that you know if whatever business you're in I think you have to accept the fact that there's going to be some lingering paradigm shifts as a result of what happened. I don't believe that things go back to the way they are. I think people go back to doing things. I think it's going to, it will, one day we'll look back and say, what pandemic? Like when no one's, you know, everyone's going out and just not thinking about it. But I think that it exposed things that are now possibilities that people enjoy, like not having to have an office employees being able to work virtually, people be able to get things delivered to them. Like those are, are conveniences that even in without a pandemic now, I think we've come to adopt. So I think you have to look at things and say, I don't know if they're gonna go back to the way they were. I think they'll go back to a better version of the way they were. So you have to be thinking strategically like that. And I think that's the big thing. If you're like in a business that, I, I think, listen, I think it's a wake up call, but anyone that was in a brick and mortar retail, location i think it's a wake-up call that you probably you know need to be considering other ways to you know get to your customer than having a lot of storefronts we see a lot of those company uh, those those um businesses and the pressure not just from the pandemic but just from the proliferation of amazon and all the stores out all the online stores out there e-commerce is here to stay yeah i think yeah i think you good advice what you just mentioned there um well thank you george i just I'm, I'm just giving you a few questions that i've asked and obviously i've got a, a, a fantastic audience of um of entrepreneurs who want to um, ask you a question as well so first of all i want to introduce you to uh, dom dom you want to ask uh, jordan a, a question 
Hi, Jordan. How you doing? How are you, Dan? Good. I actually was very fortunate to attend your three day seminar in London a few years ago. And it was a great, it was a pretty, pretty uh, life changing. I love sales. I think everything's about sales. It's what's developed me as a person and got me into where I am now because day by day, moment by moment, it's about sales. So I was just wondering, perhaps, because I'm really into it and, you know, I, I wanted to improve my sales skills. So why not go to the master salesman of the planet, Jordan Belfort event? So I did. But could you just maybe just tell the people, because this resonates so much with me, uh, what you talk about the free tenants, Jordan, you know, the free tenants that you talk a lot about and explain sure. it in a nutshell to the people. So, so basically, you know, there's like the straight line system is called that because it's like a visual representation of what happens during a sale. So like, you know, you have an open and you have a close, right? So there's two points in time, open, close. And the shortest distance between any two points is always what? It's a straight line, unless we're talking about quantum physics, right? So it's, you know, open, close, and there's a line in between. So obviously, if you could, if you control the whole encounter yourself, you'd always want to take sort of the shortest route to the close, right? This sort of perfect sale where like everything you say, every question you ask, every subject you address, the prospects like, oh my God, yeah, exactly, I agree, yes. They just like, they're along with you for the, it's almost like they're pre-sold before they enter the encounter. And then when you ask for the order for the first time, they say, oh, great, and they give you their credit card. That's like the perfect straight line sale. The problem with that is those sales are typically few and far between. While you'd love to keep them on the line moving forward towards the close, they take you off one. They have questions, they have objections, they have concerns, they interrupt you, they cut you off, right? And, and so they want to take you off the line. You're trying to keep them on the line. So what we have really are these healthy boundaries above and below the line. And when you're inside those boundaries, it's basically like you're in control, like the encounter is within an area that is germane to the conversation. You're making progress. The prospect could be speaking, you're speaking, but you're within this boundaries, you're moving forward versus being what I call often Pluto or your anus, where you're just talking about the price of tea in China, the queen, uh, Megan Markell, like all the stuff that you would think is like, let's get into rapport. But in reality, you're, in, you're off, you're, you're in Pluto. You're not talking about things that are relevant to the prospect. And it's almost like a red flashing warning, like this is not an expert I'm speaking to. Like who's gonna talk to me about, about the price of tea in China when I'm trying to sell them an automobile? It's very obvious to people that that's not real rapport. It's kind of repulsive to people. That's not to say that if there's commonalities and there's things to talk about that you can't talk about that. Yes, if it comes up in natural conversation, but it's not like, oh my God, you like fishing? I like fishing, you like hunting? And just like you're a mirror of the person, that's just ridiculous, right? So we have that, this, this sort of, this context as an open or close and this sort of tight line where you want to move the prospect forward, right? So the first basic tenet of the straight line system is that number one, you must take immediate control of the sale. So you, you, you want to be in control of the encounter, playing proactive ball, so to speak. You're proactively asking questions, whatever you're doing, talking, moving the sale forward versus playing reactive where you know, you're getting bombarded with questions and, and, and objections and so forth. So this first step is that you must take immediate control of the sale. And the reason I discovered this is because when I tried to get my 12 original Stratonites to close, they couldn't close rich people. And yet I was having no problem doing it. And I, and I, and neither was Danny. Now, and I realized that A, I was a natural born closer and I had a certain way of speaking, a certain way of talking that in a second, like within the first few seconds, the people heard something, sent something that like, they're like, wow, this guy is not the average person I speak to. So the, the idea was that you have, this is 1988, by the way, I said, you got four seconds to establish three crucial things. And what I was alluding to was this, the power of not just first impressions, but everything that results from being perceived the right way in those first four seconds. The three things that people really key on, I know whether you're sharp, you're sharp as a tack. Number two, that you're enthusiastic as hell, that what you have must be good, you're enthusiastic. And number three, most important of all, an expert in your field. 
sharp, enthusiastic, and expert in your field. You got four seconds to establish that. If you don't establish that, guess what? We've been conditioned since we're yay big that we defer. We're, we're, in the we're in the presence of someone that we believe to be an expert and believe to be the operative word, we'll defer. When our parents took us to the doctor, the doctor asked us questions. We answered our parents defer like he was an expert. We've always been taught that we defer to experts. So when you're being perceived as an expert, it allows you to naturally get control. People will see, they'll give you control of the sale and they stop cutting you off. They stop asking you questions. They have enough respect that they say, you know what? This is a person worth listening to. And why? Because they can help me achieve my goals. They can help me get what I want. People listen to you because they want to get some. They have a lack. They want to fill some need they want to fill, right? So sharp as attack, enthusiastic, as an expert in your field. You got four seconds to do it, right? I said that in 1988. In 1997, Harvard University came out with this major study, and they said, sorry, it's not four. It's seven seconds. I'm like, all right, well, I beat you by 20 freaking years, so I feel pretty good about that. So they said it was seven. They actually tested this in a lab about first impression. They, they said something even more bizarre. So, okay, fair enough, about four seconds, seven seconds. The point is you don't have very long, right? It happens like that, right? They also said that if you make the wrong first impression in a business setting, it takes seven subsequent meetings to change someone's mind about you. Now, I don't know about you, Don, but I mean, most of you don't get seven shots in business. You got one. one so shot. this idea is that you must be perceived the right way because what happens is when they give you control, it opens up a universe of possibilities. Namely, the other part of the straight line is that every sale is the same, meaning that there are certain core elements that must line up in every sale. And the way we go about lining them up well, the only way we can make it the same is if you're in control. If you're in control, you can suddenly now start doing, you can run a strategy. If they're in control, good luck. You're like, what strategy can you run when someone else is, is, is controlling the, the construct, so to speak, right? So you're in control of the construct. So now you can start actually running a, a predictable, proven strategy, which is a straight line. So the first thing is, number one, you must take control. The second tenet of the straight line is that you must use that control not to talk, 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 but to start asking questions, to gather intelligence. So you take control not to become a talking head. You take control now so you can start asking questions to the prospect. And they'll start answering you honestly and forthrightly because they respect you. You're an expert. You've earned the right to ask them a question. If you're not perceived as an expert, sharp on the ball, they'll say, They'll give you a one word answer. They'll answer your question with a question of itself. People don't, they don't, they'll fuck with you basically, right? So the second element of the straight line of this three tenets is that you then use that control that you've established to start asking questions to gather intelligence. And the third tenant is that as you are asking those questions, and most importantly, as you are listening to their answers, you're doing it in a way that builds massive rapport on both a conscious and unconscious level. The way you actually build rapport with people is by asking them questions. And then as they respond, we engage in what's called active listening. Like you're like, aha, uh ah, -huh, oh, ooh, nice, aha, uh -huh, mm. And they can tell by your grunts and groans and your ahas and oohs and ahs and your facial expressions that you care that you understand them, that you see the world the same way. And that's what real rapport is based on. Not like, oh my God, you like fishing island. That's, that's bullshit, right? So what we do with the straight lines, we fight those three things. They're instantly established and they're built on. So as you keep asking questions, you use certain tonalities. So I said to you, so, you know, so tell me, how much money do you have in the bank right now? You're like, fuck you. you know, well, what's your biggest pain point? What's really holding you back right now? Why can't you make money versus... What's your, what's your biggest pain point? And what's really holding one way they love you and like, wow, he really cares. They're like, screw you. Like, oh, I, I get it. You want to know my pain point. So, so tonality and how you frame things, the order in which you ask the questions. And also as they respond, uh -huh, mm, 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 it allows you to get to this point that by the time you're done asking questions, 
There's three things. You know, you take control, you ask questions, you build massive rapport, you do that through active listening and tonality. Then by the time you've asked all the questions you need to ask, you know all the things that you need to know to decide, A, does the person qualify financially? Can they use what I'm selling? Or maybe they're just not right for my product and you don't want to waste their time. Goes, but let's say they are right. You now get to this fourth step, which is a transition where you say, well, you know, Jim, Jill, John, Joe, you know, based on what you just said to me, this is a perfect, well, let me tell you exactly what you need. And then you offer your solution. So that's like the front half of the straight line. And when it's executed, the right, it's like beautiful to watch. Cause like the people are just like, when you're done and you say, based on everything, they're like hanging on your every, like, tell me, tell me. And that's what you want to do with the straight line. Brilliant. That's a fantastic answer, Jordan. Thank you very much. Just what we're looking for. I think that in itself was worth the visit. That five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. Master. Uh, listen, I tell you what, Brian, have we got Bri Brian Chittick? Do you want, Brian, do you want to ask Jordan a question? Yeah, Jordan, good evening. And, uh, <clears throat> I wish we had the sun you have in Mexico, but uh, happy days. Jordan, as a you know, direct salesperson and networker, uh, you know, given today's social marketing and everybody doing things on social media, um, have you ever experienced or what would your thoughts be about network marketing per se? Uh, and I know it has some gremlins and perceived uh, negativity, but, uh, you know, overall, if you look at it from a, 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 an industry, it has actually um, created more millionaires than anything else. So I just wonder what your take, and if you were starting from scratch today, would that be something that you would consider? Because obviously you do value the importance of networking, but to monetize that, what are your thoughts or what would your views be on it, please? So I think, listen, I, I, I don't, I think network marketing is uh, inherently bad in any way at all. I think I think there are bad network marketing companies. There are good network marketing companies. There are people that are good financial service people, and there are bad financial service people. Like anything else, there are honest brokers and dishonest brokers, right? I think what happens very often in network marketing is that a lot of it depends on the product being sold. There are certain things about network marketing that make it very good for products in one class and very bad for products in another class. So a lot of time what you see is someone's almost trying to shove a square peg in a round hole by using a network marketing scheme when it's really not the best fit for that product. It's better to be distributed another way. Yet when you see something that really makes sense, like there was this one I saw with travel and stuff like that, which it, it just like the, the sheer, the, the product, the fluidity of it, it just made amazing sense. Um, and it was very powerful. Um, in, in terms of social media, yeah, listen, I, I think that, you know, inherently network marketing can be an incredibly quick way to grow your business because of that network effect. And you can essentially pick up a whole downline if you're like a lot, a lot of these networkers, they jump from company to company. So, you know, when, if you're really growing fast, you'll see them growing like 10,000 salespeople at a time because they just you know, they picked up a huge downline from a company that wasn't doing well or had seen better days, right? Um, I, I think that part and parcel of that is the power of social media. I think that, you know, I am massively into the whole social game. I have a huge social footprint. I mean, yesterday alone, I think I had a, a collective like 24 million views yesterday on one. I had one video I released yesterday that had 15 million views on TikTok. 2.5 million likes, one video, I put it was 12 seconds long and it had 175,000 comments, one video, all right? Just <laughs> on one platform, right? So it was TikTok. And then I have, you know, other stuff going on on, on um, you know, Twitter. I have other stuff going on on Instagram. I have stuff on YouTube. So with social media, the idea is to know what will work on TikTok might not work on Instagram, vice versa. And how do you then use your social platform to sell things and, and, and attract people to your product, your offerings? You have to be very careful with social because, you know, people are not on social media to be sold shit. Like they're not, they're there to be entertained on TikTok. They're there to find out news on Facebook or see what their friends are doing. They want to see pictures on Instagram. So each platform is a slightly different sort of footprint of what people are doing there, right? 
But the idea is that you want to brand yourself, position yourself as an authority figure in your business. Not so much that you could sell on the platform, but then you can then transfer that from the platform off the platform and sell them on your own platform. So I think in conjunction with a network marketing downline, it's crucial for you to have a big social footprint because the first thing people do is when they're going to say, well, who, who is he? Really? Let me check out his social. And if they see you have no followers, no one looking at your stuff, they're like, ah, he's nobody. And that might be really sad because that just might not be true. I had that because like, listen, I, I neglected social media because I'm old. Like you, many of you, I didn't get I'm like, this is stupid. Thankfully, I'm lucky. I, I gave birth to two kids that are in their 20s who took over my social and my two sons are killers. Like that video I did yesterday that had 15 million views. That was all my son's doing. He said, dad, yeah, just look at the phone and say these words. <laughs> like, you know, because they understand this world. OK, and they know what my brand is and they're experts at leveraging my brand line. Are they going to do they know what I know about business? No, but they know that world. So I believe you want to surround yourself with experts in the things that you might not know that much about. And I've always done that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things with uh, and I mean, look, sales people like to be uh, like to buy, but they don't like to be sold. We, we know that. Yeah. And I think one of the things with network marketing is that uh, inherently, you know, most people that get involved are not salespeople. So you got to make it as easy. And, and that's one of the things that uh, I absolutely love about the, the, the business that we're all involved with, well, a lot of us here are involved with, because we've eliminated a lot of the, some of the barriers that were normally prohibitive. And I mean, you know, with no monthly fees. What are you guys involved in? I don't know what it is. What is it? Oh, we're, I mean, we're, we're, we're involved in, in networking uh, where there's no monthly fees. And our product is actually making people money. So we, we don't have uh, we don't have any uh, attrition, which is most unusual. But I just wonder what your take was if you were starting out, what you, what your feelings were on getting involved in networking, because obviously the whole dynamics are changing. And from a social perspective, I mean, I think we've got an amazing business model where we're showing people how to make money. Where trading is done automated for you. But you know we can share that on a on a, on a global and social basis. So I just wonder what your I mean, again, feeling I would, would be on. It. And it would depend. Like it, you know, I wouldn't be the first business I would go into. Like I wouldn't. I don't think of network marketing as like oh I'm going into network marketing. I would think of like okay I'm in. I have a product I'm going to sell. What's the best way to sell it? If that turned out to be network marketing, I would, I would go into the network marketing business. But I I, I wouldn't. It's not. It's not like you like. I think it's that. I think a problem with network marketing, when you see that problem happen is that people are trying to just be in network marketing versus it actually was a congruent thing that you had a product that really made sense to be in network marketing. So if I thought that the product would be distributed most effectively that way, then I would do it, of course, but I wouldn't just say, I'm gonna be in network marketing, I'm gonna find something I can put through the network. I think that's where you find a lot of the, the more problematic uh, offerings out there. Brilliant. Sure. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jordan. Uh, we have a question uh, from Bippy from all the way from Sweden. Are you there, Bippy? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, I'm here. How are you? I am fine. And how are you? I'm good today. <laughs> What's your question uh, for Jordan? Hi, Bippy. Hi. Uh, I think that you actually answered my question before when you were talking about the uh, motivation and, uh, and the life after jail when you came out and you still uh, find yourself motivated because I have felt sometimes in periods that I have lost my motivation. Uh, you know, when you're just trying to get there where you want and then you, yeah, you, uh, and then you, you drop, you, you actually, um, lose that motivation from time to time so uh, but I think you spoke about that that you were even though you were motivated and you were like uh, eager to success to succeed after after the period in your jail so um, but I, I, yeah I think it's normal by the way I think it's, a, it's a, <laughs> bring up a very good point though that I think that 
sometimes I think people tend to be too hard on themselves. Like, like, why am I not, why am I always not at the top of my game? Why am I not always jumping out of bed in the morning? Why am I not always feeling just like I want to take on the world? And I, and I think that that would not be possible. Because, you know, you can't always be at the top because then there is no top or bottom. It's the mid, like, that's not how human beings work. And I think that we go through our relative stages when we feel motivated and when we're unmotivated. But let me just give you a different take on that. I can compare myself to most other people and say my lack of motivation stage is far more motivated than most people's high motivation stage. So I think you really have to ask yourself, okay, when I'm not feeling motivated, do I have the ability to get myself to do the things I know I have to do, even when I don't feel like doing them? Such a great part of success as an adult in all aspects of being an adult and part of, I think what growing up is, is learning, training yourself to do the shit that you know you got to get done, even when you don't feel like doing it day in and day out versus, oh, if I really, if I enjoy it and love it and, and I'm and feeling good, yeah, then I get my stuff done. Otherwise I don't. You'll find that successful people that have long-term success, they have the ability to, on a sustained basis, get themselves to do the stuff they know they got to do, even when they don't feel like doing it. So yes, you're gonna have times when you're not feeling as motivated. And there are strategies, you know, finding your why. I'm sure you probably know about this stuff. But the point is, is that if you can get yourself, even when you're not that motivated, to keep plowing forward, that's I think what a lot of success is about. Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Daryl Irwin from Creation, uh, one of our web, uh, developers did my new website amazing uh, company and amazing team so uh, over to you daryl do you want to ask jordan a question yeah hi jordan yeah good to have you um question i've got to ask is i mean i'm quite intrigued by your your vision is to right your wrongs i think that's like quite an amazing vision to have um so it's it's like a two-phrase question but the first question is what would you tell your 16 year old self and then what would you tell your 80 year old self? I would, I would tell my 16 year old self that, you know, you need to learn to delay your gratification. I think, I think the, the, the problem I really had at a young age was um, besides that I love drugs and did massive quantities of them. You know, I'm sober now for 23 years, right? <laughs> it was a really important part of my life was getting sober, but um, was, you know, thinking that I had to make it now, you know, engaging in, in activities that were really short term focused. How much can I make? How do I grow faster versus really long term? Like, I think as, as, as we get older, certainly people that are successful, you begin to realize that, like, you know, what is business really about? Why do you go into business? What does business, what does a business do? Well, you know, in my mind, a business is really about delivering value to people in a cost-effective way. You learn how to deliver, you have something of value and the business is what allows you to deliver it to a lot of people in a cost-effective way. So at the end of the day, there's a profit, right? I think what some people think is the business is about making just making money, but it's really not. Business is about delivering value to people and then in a way that follows the rules of business so there's money made and all the great businesses have solved the major problem and have delivered massive value. That's, and that's, so I, I think I had this backwards approach in the beginning. It was more about business is about making as much as you can. And I don't think that's a sustainable strategy. I think that the money, and I love money, but I think the money becomes, comes as a natural byproduct of delivering massive value to people. People will always pay for value, but delivering it in a way that, is actually cost effective. Your marketing, your distribution, your sales. You do that so there's a lot of money made at the end of the day. I think that making a lot of money, and I think we all know this to be true, and being ethical and not mutually exclusive. You can do both. And that's what I've learned as an older person. I would definitely stand to myself at 16. At 80, I'd probably say, why the fuck did you worry so much all the time? I mean, God, you know? I mean, life is short. What's the point of all the worrying? You know, you're going to end up, you're always going to end up okay. Why do you worry? Because I worry. I think we all do that. We all, like people, one of the, my, my, my wife 
number three, all my wives have said this pretty much. I've had a bunch of them, right? The one common theme they always say is like, my God, you're so fearless. You have no fear. And I'm like, that's not true. Yeah. I'm scared of shit. I just don't let it stop me from doing things. Like I act in the face of fear. Like I'm scared. I, I, everyone is like, I just don't let it parrot. My fears don't paralyze me. My fears propel me to take action. So that gets another one, not to worry so much. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks so much. It's really, really powerful stuff. Privilege. Excellent, excellent. And, and you know what? Uh, and, our, and our next guest um, is a special guest to me personally. Um, I want to welcome Elizabeth Wilcox. She's 18 years old. She's our, my business mentor's daughter. She's landed a job at JP Morgan in London. And she was inspired by the Wolf of Wall Street movie to be a stockbroker. And, um, and, and I've seen her, I've known her, I've seen her when she was like 12, 13 years old. Now she's 18 and uh, she's living her dreams in London. So I want to welcome Elizabeth Wilcox. You've got a question for Jordan. Of course, and absolutely brilliant to get to meet you. You are my idol. It's a yeah. dream come true. Um, so my question is, do you think cryptocurrency trading would ever be mainstream for institutional investors? And if yes, do you ever think it would overtake traditional equity investments in terms of transaction values? I think the, the first answer is definitely yes. I believe it's already happening. There's a big, you know, I think there's a big war right now in, within crypto itself between decentralized and centralized solutions for cryptocurrency. Like Coinbase represents a centralized solution to what is meant to be and is the centralized architecture. Cryptocurrency is, 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 is a, a decentralizing force. Blockchain is a decentralizing force meant to essentially replace centralized institutions. So the fact that the big companies out of the gate are Coinbase, which is a centralized solution, I think is phase one of a crypto adoption. For people, it's familiar, it's safer, it resembles what I have at the normal brokerage firm. But when you think about it, like it's not the way it was meant to be, these centralized exchanges. Flip side, there's some detractors on the decentralized exchanges like security um, and so forth, especially security and losing your seed and stuff like that. And we hear those nightmare, those nightmares. But I think that what's going to happen is that over time, it's not going to be like we had that you're too young for this. I mean, the older people will know this here. It's not going to be like, is it VHS or Betamax where one survived and the other died? I think it's going to be more like Android and iPhone where you're going to have centralized solutions and decentralized solutions running side by side with crypto. I think that what we see happening right now is you obviously have somewhat of a network effect. The more people that own crypto, the more valuable, I guess, I, I don't think it becomes more valuable like in the price. It shouldn't drive, the more people, or the thing I don't like about Bitcoin is that it shouldn't be like the more people adopt it, the higher the price goes. That, that sh it should be the more it's used as an instrument of currency exchange, the more stable and less volatile it becomes. So this is, I think, an early stage of cryptocurrency where, you know, it's like the people are rushing, it's about a store of value and inflation and volatility. I think that ultimately you're going to see the United States digitized the dollar. You're going to see China's already digitizing the yuan. You'll see Britain. It's all, I think so you're going to see digitized blockchain-based solutions, which could be a pretty scary thing, by the way. It's like the ultimate big brother move is like the yuan. It's like, oh my God, like, you know, combine that with a social credit score and like, you know, your life is owned lock, stock and barrel. So I, but what I do think is going to happen is your generation, like, you know, you grew up with this stuff, this crypto, you're really comfortable around it. And I've sort of had my own movie. Like you're a perfect example. People grow up with the movie. So they all, my brand grows. I think the same thing happened with crypto. As people, it's over five years, 10 years, it's going to become more and more mainstream. I do not think it ever replaces the dollar. I don't think it's meant to be that. that. I, I think it will be ridiculous to think that's going to happen. Um, I think the governments would fight that tooth and nail because monetary policy is, you know, such an instrumental part of maintaining the social fabric of society. I think Rothschild said that, give me, I don't care about the government, give me control of the money supply and that's all I need and I control the country. So the fact to think that the U.S. 
um, that spent all those years trying to stamp out Switzerland, the Bahamas, and Liechtenstein, would suddenly say, oh, yeah, let's turn over to a bunch, the whole money supply over to a bunch of computers. They'd sooner probably send the Navy SEALs and blow up all the computers, I think, before they would allow that to happen. So I think it's what's going to happen is, is that I think that over time, you're going to see a lot of regulation, like massive regulation coming into crypto, which will be a very good thing for crypto. And you're going to have these very defined on-ramps and off-ramps into the centralized exchanges, into the centralized systems. And there'll be a lot of KYC requirements in there, anti-money laundering provisions. And I think all those are good things for crypto. And ultimately, the best thing would be solutions that would allow it to be used in daily commerce, like actual like PayPal announced they take they, crypto. It's not, it's not true. It's a joke. It's like the worst thing ever, like PayPal solution and demos. You, it, you can't even buy things with it. So I think once... People start to buy things. I think things are going to be. And, and, and remember, we. All, I think we also always think of things. We're very, you know, selfish. Us, you know, U.S., Britain. Like, oh yeah, like you know, we have a stable currency. If you're living in Venezuela, or you're living in Argentina, or you're living in Africa, you know, having a stable currency that's not devaluing every day is a really valuable thing. So I think there's this other part of the world of where they have lack of currency stability where they're underserved, for the, they're, they're not served well with the banking systems. Oh, oh, oh sorry, 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 you're cut, cut off. So they're not in, 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 in store with the banking system. I think that is what you're gonna see crypto really taking on in these countries as well. And also I think it's a major force in the world. Brilliant, thank you. Your insights are very useful in that. Thank you. Excellent. Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, we have a question from Adam Stott. Adam, are you online? Do you want to unmute yourself? Adam, you there? Adam, start you online? Adam's gone for a cup of tea, oh, as, we do, as we do in England, Jordan. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll we'll ask you a question. Mark Wilcox. Mark Wilcox, would you like to uh, ask Jordan a question? He's gone for a cup hi, of tea hi. as well. Like I wasn't expected. <laughs> and, and, I have to say, if I may, Jordan, on, on the social part of it, being you in, in uh, Cancun, which is a wonderful part uh, of a wonderful, wonderful country, if you do get a chance, we, we holidayed in, in, in Puerto Vallarta, which is the, the, the west side, and uh, highly recommend that's where I would say um, uh, Richard Burton, so, so close to our hearts, a uh, man born and bred in, in, in Wales, and, and Elizabeth from America, and the film where the predator was made. So, I mean, if you get a chance to go to the last side of the country, it is so, and I believe it is the start of the Route 66. So if you are a biker, and I'm not quite sure if you are a motorbiker, but, but if you are guaranteed to have a wonderful time. Thank you. Excellent. Paul, well, um, Paul, can we just ask a very, uh, just a couple of questions, just very quickly. Paul, one, Jordan, we've asked this a few times on the message, if you don't mind me jumping in quickly. The scenes that we saw in Wolf and Wall Street with, this, with the, the strippers and the hookers and the cocaine and looked like a great time. I wish I had a job there, by the way. Um, <laughs> and the shaving of the head and the, the, the dwarf and all that. Was, was that for real? Yeah, it was. Yeah, we, yeah it, it actually was. Um, we were, you know, it's like, I think what, what's, what's, what's hard to fathom is that, like, you know, when you see it like that, so stark on the screen, like, oh, my God, these people are crazy. But it didn't happen all at once. It happened like slowly, incrementally, like little steps where like once, you know, we had a kid in the boardroom that was uh, short of money. And we said, all right, I'll tell you what, we'll give you $10,000 and we're going to shave your head. He's like, great, I'll do it, right? And we got a barbershop pole and made a big to-do. We shaved his head, gave him $10,000, rah, rah, rah. Well, then, you know, the next time I had to shave, it's like, I'll give you five. And then two. And then wait a second. We want to shave a girl's head. Like, you know, like it's like, you know, what's next? It's always what's next? What's the next thrill? So that's when you see how it, it, it devolves where it becomes like the Roman Coliseum after a while. And that was really the way it went. And what about the goldfish? Was that for real? 100%. Wow. <laughs> um, Paul, I'm just going to jump in here and ask um, Jordan a question, if you don't mind. Oh, feel okay. Free. Feel free. Um, Jordan, after you came um, out of jail and that, after you had uh, divulged all the secrets and, uh, and spoken about the different people involved in all these scams, et cetera, et cetera, was your life threatened? Did you have to have bodyguards? No. So number one, every single person was already cooperating. 
pretty much. It wasn't like there was people I was co cooperating against that weren't cooperating already. Like in, in the United States, like, you know, you have two options. Either they, they say, okay, either you can plead guilty and cooperate and get, you know, X number of years or not and go 35 years in jail and lose your whole life. So everybody, including the mob, like anything you see in the movies where the mob does, everybody in the, in the U.S. cooperates, right? I actually had one, I did something very stupid, in fact, which you saw in the movie, which is true, is I wouldn't cooperate. I, I cooperated, but I wouldn't rat out one of my close personal friends. I felt like I had to draw the line somewhere. So I was giving information on people, but I wouldn't rat out a very close personal friend. And I passed him a note. You know, it wasn't Danny, that, it, that was fiction. It was not, and it was true, but not Danny, it was someone else. I passed them a note and then three months later, they got indicted for something else and turned me and ratted me out. So like, and I, I did an extra four months in jail for that or else I would have done less time in jail. So, and I, and I wasn't upset about that. You know, I, I felt like I, I did the right thing. I maintained my integrity. And I, listen, to say that, oh, you're not going to cooperate. When you're facing 30 years in jail and you have a wife and children who are, you know, and you're four and two um I, I you know you don't find anyone here that does it that's the way it works here cool good i, I just <laughs> one last question jordan what what um i know i know this answer is you i've shared you've shared it on video before on goldcast but what what motivated you inspired you when, when you were in prison what what was like uh what what when, when you went to bed at night and you were sleeping what was that what was the moments that inspired you to say get through it all um, it was, it was certainly my children. Like, I mean, I, you know, again, I wasn't in a terrible jail. Um, but you know, when you're in jail, jail sucks and you're, you know, and, and I, at those moments when, you know, I really felt like I couldn't go on or just couldn't get myself motivated. I was trying to learn to write back then. And, uh, I would close my eyes and imagine the faces of my two children. And that was really my why that was what kept me going. And, and not to get rich, but to come back out and show my kids that I could come back from that and, and be a role model to them. And, you know, and the most amazing moment I had, I guess, for the first of many was when, uh, you know, my door after the, it was announced that, you know, I wrote the book and, and, um, and it was being made into a movie. And like, you know, my daughter was acting very nonplussed, like, oh, oh, at 11 years old, you know, like didn't show that she really cared much about that, you know, oh, great dad. Like she wasn't impressed that Leo was going to play her dad. You know, I walk by her door and she's like, guess what? My father's being played by Leo. And I hear her beaming with pride at 12 years old. So like, yeah, it was, it was many amazing moments like that of watching my children um, in, in awe of my, of my comeback because they saw what happened to my life. I lost everything. And, um, and then it just became more like me serving as a role model for them in their own to live in power lives. My kids, two of my kids work for me. My sons both work for me. Uh, they're amazing. I, my daughter's a, a very successful psychologist, went to NYU grad school. I have great kids. I'm really fortunate. And that really was, you know, what allowed me to, to make it through everything in the way I did. And I always say that, you know, when you really find your why, it's not going to be about making money. It's not going to be about you or your possessions. It's going to be about someone that you love or people you love unconditionally or a cause that you truly believe in. I think we'll always do more for other people that we love and causes we believe in. That's where your power lies to really go out and get things done in life. Well, I gotta say that you inspired us again. Um, it's been a great honor. I know that exceeded your time, your precious time. Uh, I wanna say this is a huge big thank you for you know, sharing your insights tonight. It's an absolute honor to have you on.